Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see everybody's faces. Holy God, you give us one day at a time, long enough for laughter to follow any tears, deep enough for prayer and silence to dance together, time enough to help someone in need, plenty of time to notice beauty and praise our maker, significant time to build a bridge of forgiveness and tear down a wall of resentment, the right time to embrace friends, smile at strangers, play with children, and sing praises to our God. Lord, we thank you for the days that you give us. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Our opening hymn is 545, The Church's One Foundation. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of 545. Please stand. remain standing for our affirmation of faith found on page 880 the Nicene Creed we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ the only Son of God eternally begotten of the Father God from God light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please turn with me in your hymnal to page 12 in, in your hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, God. to God. Amen. Will the ushers come forward for our morning offering of God's tithes and our, our gifts?
gracious God, we believe in the amazing gift of your Son. We share this offering with the unceasing prayer that your work in this world will spring up and break forth in this global community. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. You may be seated. reading this morning from the letter of Peter to the dispersed Christians throughout Asia Minor. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the kind and gentle, but also to the overbearing. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you do wrong and are beaten for it, you take it patiently? But if, when you do right and suffer for it, you take it patiently, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joel. Let us pray together. Gracious and holy God, we come before you this morning longing for your word, longing for your word in our hearts and our lives to transform us, to make us whole, and to make us your disciples. In Christ's name we pray, amen. First Peter was written to help Christians, as, as Joel says, in Asia Minor who were considered God's chosen strangers, Gentiles, to serve in a hostile world. 
In Roman times, there were certain household codes, codes to follow, and there was as many as 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Can you imagine 60 million slaves? They were, the slaves were prisoners of war. All the, all the work of Rome was done by the slaves. They did not only do the menial work as slaves, they also served as teachers and actors and doctors and other educated roles. Roman citizens lived pampered lives. Slaves were not allowed to marry, but could have children. But those children, they could have partnerships, but those children that they bore in those partnerships belonged to the Roman government. The children belonged to the slave owners of the Roman government, and they, were, they, were, they had no rights of their own. Peter is talking about the slaves here, and he's not telling us that slaves are what God endorses. God doesn't endorse slavery, does he? No. He's telling us that God loves everyone regardless of what nation they come from, regardless of who they are, what their social status is, regardless of what color they may be, that God loves everyone. Now, if Peter couldn't solve the problem of slavery in the Roman world, but he could give the slaves hope. And that's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to give the slaves hope because there were lots of slaves who were suffering. Slaves are to accept the authority of their masters, not only the kind and gentle masters, but also those who are harsh toward them. That seems unfair, doesn't it? The hope Peter gives is there's there's a new household code, and they were to follow this household code with a new family allegiance. And this family was the family of Christ. Peter's group, who appears to be aliens in Roman times, are now citizens of God's own family. And if you notice, I had Joel to read a different scripture than what I started out with. I did... 2 Peter 2, 18 through 25. Sometimes pastors get to change their mind according to how the Spirit leads. <laughs> so the citizens are now citizens of God's own family. They're not citizens that have no rights. They're not citizens that don't matter. They're not citizens of people who lord over them. They're citizens of a God who cares. They're taught not to return evil for evil, but good for good. Now, how, how hard is that for us to do? How hard is it for us to not return evil for evil? To not get upset when somebody says something that doesn't, doesn't work with us or against what we have to say and not just be downright ugly about it. It's easy to do that, isn't it? I, 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 I have a hard time with that. I'm sure some of us do. But they're taught by Peter that unjust suffering was something that they were to endure, and to this they were called by God. Not that God wanted them to suffer unjustly, but since they were suffering unjustly, to make something good out of it. Just like Paul, his suffering was used for good, wasn't it? Even though they were treated badly for no reason, God notices and God honored their perseverance and their suffering. This concept seems so strange to us in the 21st century world. We're all about civil rights. And unlike the first century Roman world, where it was considered a civic virtue to remain in one's social level, 
it was a virtue to remain in one social level. You didn't rise above that. You stayed where you were. That seems unfair to us, doesn't it, in our, in our world today? First Peter says, if you endure when you, when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. Now, he doesn't say that if you're, if you're causing pain to come up on yourself, sometimes we cause destruction for ourselves, don't we? We cause pain on ourselves. But he talks about if you do right and suffer for it, if you're suffering for good, then you're suffering for God. You're, you're having God's approval. It is good to endure pain unjustly for righteousness sake, Peter says. It seems like Peter is saying suffering is good, but he's not. He's saying those who are suffering, the reality is that those who are living under Roman household codes can't live too far outside of their own social structures. And we can't live too far outside of our social structures either, can we? What happens if we break the law? Even if the law is unfair, what happens? Rick could, Rick could take us, give us a ticket and take us to jail. <laughs> and I'm picking on Rick because he's a former police officer, not that Rick is a mean guy. He was a good cop. <laughs> I know Rick was a, a good cop because I've heard his stories. He was gracious and generous. But it would be deadly for them if they did that. Slaves were to be subject to their masters and subject to the authority of the Roman Empire. But there's hope for a better life by following Christ, just like the suffering servant in Isaiah. The servants suffering unjustly, and it turned Israel around. They realized there was something special in this suffering servant that they had not seen in others. Now, God can use suffering to turn us around. Have you ever suffered? Not that God brings suffering on us to turn us around. But when we suffer and we give ourselves up to God, God can use that for good. It's like beauty from ashes. God can use our suffering for good. And God desires for us to, to, to be transformed. We may not be slaves today, but we do have people who have authority over us. Sometimes that authority can be harsh or cruel. And this is very difficult for us. To be a subject of injustice is difficult for anyone, isn't it? We tend to feel we don't deserve suffering. Well, we don't, but maybe, maybe sometimes our actions do. This, this passage calls us to be the best we possibly can to be good at everything we do, to try our best, and to show respect, and to give it our all. To be good is to reflect Christ. First Peter says, get rid of all ill and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. Those are hard things to get rid of, aren't they? Ill, deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. You know, sometimes we slander each other and don't even realize it. When we gossip about things and others, we're slandering somebody, aren't we? Instead, like a newborn baby, Peter says, desire the pure milk, of the word. This passage asks us to do what is not natural for us to do in order to live a godly life. 
In other words, go that extra mile. It's a tough calling. But the slaves needed something to hold on to. They needed hope. And so many times, these passages about slaves have been used the wrong way, even in the Christian church. But that's not what Paul Peter is saying here. He's giving them hope. We are called to learn to live within the social structures, uh, social structures of our lives that seem unjust with grace and dignity. You know, Jesus faced the same thing. He encountered all kinds of opposition. He encountered all kinds of suffering, and yet he faced what he encountered with grace and dignity. He could have lashed out, but he didn't. Can you imagine how it must have felt for him? He was silent when they are accusing him falsely. It's hard to be silent when someone is falsely accusing you. Can we follow Jesus and trust our whole lives to the one who judges justly? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We're called to patient enduring. And Christian endurance is to suffering is a high calling. C.S. Lewis once answered the question, why do righteous suffer? Why not, he replied. They are the only ones who can take it. Now, there's a story in the Daily Bread, and it's just something I picked up, the Daily Bread. Sometimes I read it, sometimes I don't. But I picked up a story from the Daily Bread, because that's not a Methodist uh, devotion, is it? A. Parnell Bailey visited an orange grove where, migration, where a migration pump had broken down. The season was unusually dry, and some of the trees were beginning to die for lack of water. The man giving the tour took Bailey to his own orchard where in irrigation he had used sparingly. These trees, he says, could go without water for another two weeks. Why? He says, I frequently kept water from them. He said the hardship caused them to send their roots deeper into the soil, soil to search for moisture. Now mine are the deepest rooted trees in the area. While others are being scorched by the sun, these are finding moisture at a greater depth. My daddy had a philosophy that you don't try to protect everybody from suffering. He says, you won't be a good person if you protect someone from suffering. You won't learn about life. And you won't learn how to be strong. Often when we reach deep within our suffering, we see God at work giving us greater depth, giving us life and hope. And we can find God even in the darkness of our suffering. We often forget others are watching, watching our suffering, longing to see God's face in our lives as we rise above our suffering. For this reason, we have been called to be like Christ. Christ left us an, led, left us an example of how to suffer, to suffer for good, to rise above the suffering and bring freedom and life. Remember, Peter says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll turn in your hymnal to page 13, the great thanksgiving. You know, this uh, communion is just a prayer, isn't it? It's a great thanksgiving for what God has done for us. And we come to this prayer with our hands open, our hands folded. We don't come grabbing. We come to receive God's offering to us, don't we? We don't grab Christ. We receive Christ with grace and love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a special covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We remember that this table is God's table. It's not ours. It's not a Methodist table. It's not a... It's not a, a, any denominational table. It's God's table. And God's table is free and open to all to receive. 
Will you come? Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we thank you that you gave your one and only Son. And Lord, we don't understand this holy mystery of Jesus suffering death and resurrection. But we live in faith knowing that this is our salvation. This is our freedom and this is our hope in the world. In a world that's broken in a world of injustice, in a world of many troubled and suffering people. Lord, lift us up and make us whole. In Christ's name, amen. Our sending forth hymn is 172, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of 172. Please stand. Please stand. 